Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It's Thursday, February 17th. Pitcher Week rages on episode three of this week as we move through the 200 to 300 range overall. Talking about the pitchers that are drafted in that range in NFBC drafts, looking at drafts that have happened over the past you know, 15 days or so. This is a group of pitchers where you start to find discounted injured guys, at least more of them. You start to find uh, some players on the rise that maybe have major innings concerns, even greater than some of the pitchers we talked about on the Wednesday episode. Uh, so a fun group. This is where sleepers tend to start coming from in a lot of instances. And we kick it off today with uh, an old boring guy, Pinjin Ryu, whose stuff appears to be breaking down despite the depth of his arsenal. The projections don't really like him. The market is beginning to sour on him. Is there an old, boring oatmeal pick to be made here, or are you also ready to sort of walk away from Ryu as that rotation stabilizer that he used to be on a per inning basis? I don't know the you know the injuries are creeping up. Uh, the you know the the injury projection is creeping up. Uh, we've have basically now. Uh, you know, since his first season in the big leagues, uh, we have one season with more than 175 innings. Uh, I suppose he was healthy and looked good in 2020. And that sort of uh, makes you kind of think, well, you know, maybe, maybe this is just a one year blip. I mean, if you, if you look past the innings, at least you've got a two, six, nine ERA, a two, three, two ERA in 2019, you know, 80 innings of a one, nine, seven ERA in 20. Uh, 18 and even uh 2017 which is a little bit more bulk 377 era like i don't know it's like it looks pretty good but last year you have the worst swing strike rate of his career worst strikeout rate of his career um you know a reduction in in ground ball rate uh injuries uh i don't know it, it you know it makes at some point i think your stuff just falls off to the point that you're more like a, a, this is a weird comp, maybe, but like a Cole Irvin mm. at some point. Like y y it does matter that you have, um, you know, five different pitches and you can command them pretty well. Uh, but you know, the, the cutter has been losing uh, drop over the years. Uh, you know, the ride on his four seam um, at the end of the season last year was the worst of his career um and that when you when you have that where your ride is dropping on your four seam and your cutter is losing drop they're converging you know vertically so they don't have that much of a difference between them and that's very important for him because he's a very good change-up guy but the cutter is uh is the breaking ball that that works for him um you know then i see uh the fact that his, his release point uh dropped oh, what is it uh, like about five inches over the course of the season last year. And his release point at the end of the last season was lower than it ever had been. So I don't know, put that all together. And you're kind of like, there is always the opportunity to, you know, healthy off season train, you know, get that release point back up, fix whatever, you know, had been ailing him. Uh, but that sort of gradual decline over the course of the season makes you think, well, even if he starts off better next year, he's going to do that over the rest of the year. Yeah, some legit fade potential. I mean, age is catching up to Ryu as well. He's going to be 35 in March, but currently training in uh, Korea with, I believe, one of his old KBO teams. So you know, he's up to something of his own during this uh, Maybe. lockout time. Maybe he's better off than some people. I mean, you know, some of the facilities over there are good. Uh I don't know that the uh, coaching, like sort of the pitch shape coaching type stuff is um, up to par uh, with every team, uh, as from what I've heard. But um, maybe he's got the right, he, the, the facilities at least would be good. And maybe he's got, he's working with the right partners right now. So, um, you know, I would, I, the, the Blue Jays are a good pitching coaching team. So maybe before everything got locked out, they, they sent him home with a good plan. Uh, he had like, you know, the blue Jays must know this about his arm slot and about the, <laughs> the movement, you know, but what they like, can dropping arm slot a lot of times is 
something hurts and I'm trying to find a place that doesn't hurt. Yeah, and I think he's also one of those guys because of the time he's missed in the past and with the significant arm injuries that caused him to miss that time, you worry that the the wear and tear is becoming more of a problem for him and, and it's harder to come back from something that's a, a long-term problem like that. So I'm not going to talk people out of drafting him where he goes, but I don't think he's a must-draft bounce-back player there either. Just kind of a, a decent filler and where probably... do you have him? I have him around 63rd, like, you know, right there with like a injured Noah Syndergaard. And uh, you I've know, got him behind Wainwright. Man, Adam Wainwright. I have him right there. <laughs> yeah, I got Wainwright. him behind Wainwright, uh, just slightly ahead of, of Jordan Montgomery. Got him ahead of John Means right now. Similar injury risk, I guess. But Means, I think I need to nudge up a little bit because of the, the changes to the ballpark. So in that range, right in the back of the top 60. Yeah, means is a surprising injury projection. But yeah. uh, why should it be surprising? He was injured last year. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you have that in, in our back pockets. <laughs> uh, let's talk about Patrick Sandoval for a moment. I don't have him ranked in this group. I I don't know if I'm missing something with him or, or what the story really is here. Good results last year. 362 ERA, 121 whip. Uh, zone contact rate was pretty low as well. 79.1% kind of stands out among the pitchers that I've got him ranked against. I think he gets drafted with the likes of of Means and, and Ryu and, and Adam Wainwright. And I'm more in line with what the bat has for a projection, like a mid fours ERA and decent strikeouts. But I, I don't know. Like, do you see a change that he made to unlock something? Or do you think this is is bound to be a disappointment? I see a lot of excitement about Patrick Sandoval and the the quoted reason I, I'm I'm totally into, which is the fact that he has a good slider and a good changeup. You know, uh, that's kind of rare. You know, most of the time you have one or the other. Um, and uh, both of his pitches are good. The model likes them. Uh, everything is hunky dory. I don't think the fastballs are good. I don't think the fastballs are good. Uh, the model doesn't like them. And then when I look at them, uh, the four seam has an inch less ride than usual. And the sinker has okay fade, but it doesn't have good drop. So he's got two tweener fastballs. And, you know, the results on those pitches are also not good. He has a two, he gave up a two, he gave up a 534 slugging last year on the four seam. 13 home. Massive. It's really big. It's not a good pitch. If you switch the sinker, you know, it got it got a lower ISO. Um, but I bet you it got a lower strikeout rate too. Let me see if I got that here. Uh whiffs. Uh, see, the sinker got more whiffs and way more ground balls. Uh, the model says moving to the sinker would not be a good move. Um, so maybe it just gets more uh better results because he uses it a fifth of the time that he uses this four scene. So he uses this four seam, but it's not a good four seam. Uh, and I, and I, in terms of like sleeper, you know, prospects and stuff, like if he was a sleeper and I was, you know, sp spending sleeper prices where, you know, where I have him ranked, uh, he's up against Tariq Skubal, Aaron Ashby, Joe Ryan, Tyler Magill, you know, those are sleepers for me, right? I will group those together and treat them as sleepers. Patrick Sandoval, for some reason, seems to be going as like a, a, sure, a sure thing. Um, and if you look at uh, Scooball's fastball, it rates better uh, than Sandoval's. Uh, but each of those guys has questions. Uh, and Sandoval has questions. People are, to me, acting as if he has no questions. And then... Uh, I don't know why, but he has a 45-day injury projection. That's just, was he injured last year? Maybe I, think, yeah, I think he missed time at the end of the year, if I'm not mistaken, which is why hmm. the breakout that he seemed to be having was cut short. Any case, uh, if you want the long story short, bad fastball, good secondaries. It's, it's a common story. It was a uh, lumbar spine problem. Yikes. Yeah, so that, that's where that injury projection comes from. Yeah, and then and you know all the other guys that I have uh, listed in that sort of sleeper category, uh, none of them have the same injury projection. They're all young. 
the guy that I like that goes right after him is Tanner Houck. And I, I like Houck for the same reasons I like Michael Kopech. I think the big question we're going to have to overcome with Houck is with mostly a fastball slider combination last year, I think he threw those two pitches like 93% of the time based on the Savant numbers. Does he have enough? Can he go to something else? Can he go to the changeup a little bit more to get deep enough into games consistently to be a good starter from a just a basic peripheral standpoint, he looks undervalued and kind of like a, a worthwhile risk where he's going. If you're trying to catch a little bit of lightning in a catch some lightning in a bottle in this range. Yeah. The split finger doesn't do well by stuff, but he locates it well, which I'm guessing just means uh, he drops it off the plate. Um, he doesn't throw it enough to, for me to consider it a real third pitch. Uh, so he's kind of a two fastball slider guy. I have seen him back foot the slider enough to where, you know, some of those Chris Sale righty, uh, you know, dreams or, you know, like sort of the uh, comps that people throw. They're sort of faith, faith comps. I don't know. There should be a word for that. Faith based comps um, that I can see a little bit. He can bury the the back foot slider against uh, lefties, and that'll be huge because he has to figure out something against lefties. Uh, but and then there's also you know in terms of uh, the results, you know some of them were put up in in shorter stints, right? So uh, you know, how long can he go into games? And then there's uh, the depth chart concern, which is him versus Garrett Whitlock, I guess. Uh, there's some uh, rumblings that Garrett Whitlock will stretch out and take his job. But uh, I feel pretty comfortable that Hauk has like, you know, better upside than Michael Walker or, you know, even Rich Hill or, you know, some of these older guys they, they pulled in. So I just, you know, in terms of shape of season, you may want to, you may be surprised that Tanner Hauk doesn't make the opening day rotation. I'd be frustrated by that because I, I guess I see Waka being, the guy that should be used the way Hauk was last year and mm. Hauk's role should be expanded. I don't know if that's just me wish casting and, and projecting. What oh, I wish casting. Here. That's the word. Yeah, it's, it's a good word. But, uh, but Garrett Whitlock, I, I mean, geez, like I, they, they have an unsettled closer situation. He could be the closer too. Couldn't he? Like, <laughs> yeah. Right. Isn't that in the range of outcomes. And in fact, I think they may have more need back there. I don't think Ryan Brage was that great. Uh, Sawamura and Hernandez have pretty bad command, if I remember correctly. At least uh, Hernandez does. Uh, I don't. I don't. I think that that bullpen goes like one and a half, or two deep, basically. I, I have some respect for Mike Barnes, but uh, beyond that, I, I think that bullpen is not very deep. And taking Whitlock out of that bullpen, I'd be like, yeah, uh. <laughs> that's the noise I'd make. It's a little bit like the old uh, Tim Allen home improvement sound, I think. From, <laughs> but, but like an updated version where it's like, it's a knockoff version. <laughs> you got the the counterfeits, the, the counterfeit but, DVDs, and the actors <laughs> were dubbed over. You get that sound. But I, I do see some helium in certain drafts, too. Hauk is, has a, a wide variance draft to draft. Do you have a Max and Mins in front of you? Yeah, yeah. It, it, let's see, just for February, one sixty six was the earliest. Three oh six was the latest. What, what's up with that? That yeah, give me all the shares of three oh six. You know, I'm fine there. One sixty six. Uh, you know, now you're going up against people that aren't as crowded depth chart. I mean, I just want to point out the depth chart. It's this. So you got Eovaldi. He's going to be in there. Pavetta probably, but you know, he could do, lose his job. Sale is going to be in there. The, so let's say those are the three that are for sure. After that, you got Waka, Hill, Hauk, and Paxton. Like, don't forget Paxton. I mean, he's not going to be ready for the early part of the season, though, right? No, but th but say let's say you 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 start out the season with Waka in the rotation. You got Waka and Hill in the rotation. Then, as Hauk is like getting closer to you know taking Waka's job, Paxton's also getting healthy. So anyway, uh, there's. It's just a it's a faint bit of whis whisper of, of risk. I have Hauk uh, above all the pitchers we've talked about so far. I have him at 60 or 15, 60 right now. It's a good place to be. Yeah, I have him slightly overranked, probably at 48, because mm -hmm. I think at the time that I initially set it, it was 
right prior to their depth additions before the lockout started, where it looked even clearer that he was going to be the guy. But with all the right. injury risk they're taking on, it's easier for me to talk myself into him getting that opportunity. So you can count me in the I'm on board with uh, Tanner Houck group. Here's a, a puzzle. Adam Wainwright, how did 2021 happen? Actually, because... for some reason, have him right behind Tanner Houck. Why? They're the... the diametrically opposed opposite players <laughs> mm-hmm. i i don't have a good explanation i didn't have a good explanation as it was happening i don't have one with more time to absorb it <laughs> he's 40 now he turned 40 back in august i mean he stayed in st louis so he's still got a good <clears throat> good park and defense so that's good you know that's that's unchanged but it's curveball is unchanged it was always good what was happening from 2016 to 2019, though? Like, how <laughs> how can we just look at that entire four year stretch and say, oh, well, you know, that just didn't happen, and just keep moving forward, especially given his age? Like, I I I don't know what to do with Wayne. Right? He's not All right. he's not cost prohibitive, but if he somehow did what he did again, if he repeats what he did last year, that's amazing and great value. I. No one expects it. The projections don't expect it. I don't know any people out there saying he's going to do it again. But what the heck did he do last year to pull that off? Well, uh, the Pitching Plus model says that the curveball is elite, uh, one of the top three in the game, and none of his other pitches by stuff are above average. But he locates the curveball, changeup, cutter, and sinker above average, and the four-seam at average. So... It's a little bit like one elite pitch and a bunch of good location otherwise. So, you know, I don't think that like it is instructive to notice that by the end of last season, his fastball was slower than it ever been. Right. So that's not good news. <laughs> Who else operates uh, like this? Who else has one elite Rich pitch? Hill. So he's like, OK, so there's a Rich Hill comp. Yeah. Rich so he's Hill. a right handed Rich Hill. Yeah, and he has he has more pitches than Rich Hill. Uh, less injury risk. Uh, and better command. I think that's it. But I think most of the time, he's trying to sneak a cheese past the rat when it comes to every pitch except for the, the, the curveball. Sneak a cheese past the rat? I, <laughs> I'm I secretly know. 60 years old. Uh, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> Your explanation is as good as any, and I, I think as someone who has been willing to throw darts at Rich Hill for several years, even exactly you, like you, 120 you, innings. I, you like I Rich think, Hill at all? I, I think I should probably be a little more intrigued by Wainwright based on on that breakdown. If the curveball is still that good and everything else is located that well, and the conditions are such that he's got the great defense behind him and a pitcher friendly ballpark. I guess uh, the mid threes or high threes ERA and a decent whip are are very possible again. And as obviously he exceeded it last year, so I'll, I'll take I'll take your explanation as a satisfactory one. There is this adage that spin ages better than velo. Hmm. Okay. All right. All right. Let's get to a few more names from this group. Jordan Montgomery, who always feels pretty overshadowed. In uh, the Bronx, you, know, you got Eric Cole there. You got Severino getting healthy. Jordan Montgomery quietly gets better, and people don't seem to notice. But he has to deal with Yankee Stadium and the AL East. So I, I get it. I understand why people aren't tripping over themselves to draft him. But I think he, he, like Sandoval versus Montgomery to me is is a, one of those. That I, I prefer Montgomery even in the more difficult circumstances because I think there's actually a little bit less injury risk with Montgomery. And I think the skills might be just a tick more stable at this point. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I take Jordan Montgomery to me, uh, Jordan Montgomery. The interesting comp is Eduardo Rodriguez. Hmm. Um, the difference is that Jordan Montgomery's stuff rates a little bit better and his park rates a lot worse. Uh, but that's, that's the pairing I have. Uh, where they're definitely going to be in their rotations. The health outcomes have been good for the most part. Uh, the command is good. 
And, uh, you know, they've both, I think, outperformed some of their expectations. Uh, and none of the none, none of their pitches stands out as amazing, but uh, they've got enough to mix and match, and none of their pitches are just terrible. Yeah, we're looking at a, a two-year run now, like a low fours ERA, 128 whip. He was a tick better than that in ERA uh, in the full 2021 season. Should give you some wins back. Decent you know, number of strikeouts because there's volume. Just ticks a lot of the boxes that we care about. Yeah. Uh, and uh, for what it's worth, uh, the injury part, uh, where he is going and where, you know, who he's going up against, it's kind of nice to get a guy that you think might give you a bunch of innings. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think out of the pitchers we've talked about so far, he might be the safest for innings of the entire group. Yeah. Because you I know it doesn't, concerns and injuries for like, other guys. Yeah. It feels icky to like draft a player that probably, you know, will put an ERA, like a low four ERA uh, up. But I have a Ty, a James and Tyon pretty close to him. And Tyon has all the same issues. And then you throw the injury risk on top of it. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, also just a, a low four ERA is usable these days. I, I think a low four ERA is close to fantasy average. Well, yeah. And I, I think with universal DH, you know, the NL ERAs are going to go up. So mm -hmm. there's going to be even fewer guys that are living in the high twos and the threes as a result of, of that change, too. So um, that's the other just kind of calibrating accordingly based on, on that change is something that's going to take me a little time to do, I think. Because I, I see a four ERA, a 120 anything whip, and I'm like, eh, yeah, it's just fine, but it's it's not really what I want. It's, it's actually kind, not that it, bad. It's kind of pitching oatmeal. Yeah. Yeah, we're we're in the oatmeal phase for sure. Well, uh, it, we're in the oatmeal phase, but it's interesting because here I think most people want to take the shiny object, you know, the Tanner Houck, the Aaron Ashby, you know, all that stuff. They want they want the 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 prospect, the you know. But uh, you know, if you've taken a lot of risk earlier, like we in the last show we talked about Carlos Rodon. If you took Carlos Rodon, and in my in my league, uh, I I then paired Carlos Rodon with Noah Syndergaard later, so <laughs> I'm all in on the risk. I'm doing a modified. A modified Derek Van Riper. <laughs> I told you that it was a bad idea. I regretted doing <laughs> yeah. that. I made that very clear to everybody that I did I did it wrong. The, so I need some oatmeal. And if you did anything like that in your draft, uh, Montgomery could be some good late oatmeal. Because I took the Noah Syndergaard. Why not? He's just so good when he pitches. I took that line of thinking. And, well, you know, at the end of last year when he came back briefly, he wasn't throwing all of his pitches. And I guess the follow-up question is, how much does that really matter given the circumstances? I mean, do you do you have legitimate concerns about Syndergaard from a, a stuff perspective, even though we saw him come back briefly with that limited arsenal last year? Yeah, it's tough because there is some good research that suggests that fastball velocity coming back off of the, the IL uh, stabilizes really quickly. That's something that Jeff Zimmerman found. So even though uh, he only pitched two innings, you know, there is some signal, not a ton of signal, but some signal in the 94-7 fastball velocity. So that's not great. Uh, but he didn't throw a single breaking ball. And so it's not too surprising that his stuff score is bad. And I'm just going to take as a good sign that he got on the mound at all. Uh, two innings pitched is really pushing the uh, amount of inf like you're really trying to juice a lot of information out of two innings. You know what I mean? <laughs> you might recall on the, yesterday's episode, I talked about listening to an interview with Clayton Kershaw on the Dan Patrick show. Right, so, exactly. you know, that's, that's where I'm at. <laughs> Nothing against Dan Patrick. I of, of all the national sports talk people, he's one of the handful I would actually listen to by choice if you know I were in the car and was going to listen to a show. So yeah. Yeah, and, and so I'm choosing to, the, the the information, the only information I'm choosing to rest from those two innings is that he pitched two innings. Like, I, I like that he got up on the mound. And the, you know, otherwise, I look back to his previous work, and he, you know, when he was pitching, he was one of maybe five, six, seven pitchers that would have, you know, uh, better than a 105 stuff plus and 105 uh location plus like he actually has good command it's pretty amazing for a guy who throws that hard and has that nastiest of a stuff that he that he has pretty good command so the upside i think is 
way better than the projections are putting down for him. Like, way, I think the projections are a miss. I think it's it's just a 50-50 thing. If he pitches, he's going to be good, and he's going to be way better than those projections. If he doesn't pitch, it's going to be a wasted pick. But where he goes, there are some – it's it's not it's okay to waste some picks. And I think that's kind of the, the hard thing for me about the conversation we had on Wednesday with – Clayton Kershaw and even Carlos Rodon. If it, if you believe in Cindergard's talent and you look at them as reasonably similar injury risks, although I was looking through those injury projections, Kershaw has the second worst injury projection of everyone who has one, which people can see on the <laughs> Athletic on Friday. So there are, there are levels within this, but I look at Cindergard and I wonder maybe that's like the sweet spot for taking on risk. I, I think the six man rotation it doesn't actually doesn't hurt him because I wouldn't expect him to get to 190 yeah. innings off yeah, surgery nobody's, anyway. Nobody's asking for, yeah, I think the most you'd want is like 125, 150 anyway. And that's the most he can get in a six man rotation, but maybe the six man rotation also helps him. You know, short of really not getting two start weeks very often. You get those a little less in a six man rotation, but otherwise like what's the, what's the drawback here? Given the, there's, there's going to be some cookie matchups though, too. If, you know, especially if Oakland sells and pitching in Oakland, um, you know, there's going to be, I think pitching in Texas, even with the newer lineup there, pitching in Texas is, it's a good place to pitch. Anaheim is, is about average. So I think, uh, it's a decent place to pitch and, uh, he's got, we're, you know, at one point we tried to ban the word upside. <laughs> he's got, uh, potential. <laughs> he could exceed his draft day price. There you go. Easily. God, I hate talking like that. Why do I? Why do I talk <laughs> like that? Uh, the thing about this, too, if you look at Severino and Clevenger, who were, were on previous episodes, I I, I lump Cindergard in with them. I just think the risk profiles are really similar. Expectations for workload are similar. What those guys have done when they were healthy are similar. Mm-hmm. I think you could even probably say Cindergard's track record per inning is better than Clevenger's. So maybe those two should even be flipped. So I'm puzzled as to why he falls so far below the rest of that group based on how I was grouping these players in my mind as I was starting to to put everything together uh, for the season. Uh, but we keep kind of mixing and matching. This is the order of the board. Anthony Desclafani is in this range as well. He re-upped the Giants. Oatmeal, just like Jordan Montgomery. I, I'm glad he stayed in San Francisco. That's key for the home run rate, staying nice and low potentially, or at least at a reasonable sort of level. Projections are not buying him for a near repeat. Not, not even close. I'm curious to know if you think they might be wrong in this case for any particular reason. I don't know. The model thinks he's good. Uh, he upped his velo, uh, but I do think projections now have uh, velo in them for the most part. Um, so I'm not necessarily, I'm not saying the projections uh, don't have that in there, but, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I think, uh, I think he's perfectly fine. I, I've i targeted him in drafts, and I don't know. How, how much of a difference is there between him and Chris Bassett? Hmm. I mean, the projections say $13 for Chris Bassett and zero for Discofani, but nice home parks, underrated arsenal. You know, in this case, the model says above average stuff, above average command. I guess the one thing that does bug me a little bit about Disclafani that I will mention is that um, he had a bit of a velo boost last year. And I suppose you could have velo in your model, but also regress it some or age it, right? So uh, I guess it didn't, he didn't have a velo boost last year, but he in 2020 he did, and he's falling off of that. So you know, what if he goes back to 93.6 where he was in 2018? Well, in 2018, he had a 4.93 ERA. So is he living on the precipice a little bit when it comes to Velo? You know, because he used to be 93 and he wasn't as good at 93. Then he jumped over to 94 and he was better. 94, actually 95. But last year was 94.1. So what if it's 93.8 or 93.6 next year? Uh, well, how much that change his outcomes? So. Perhaps that's baked into the projection system. I mean, it really could be, but he's got three seasons now with uh, a K-minus BB percentage above 15%. So the, those skills are, are really solid. 
when he was bad, it really was an inflated home run rate. He left Great American Ballpark. He stayed in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So I just think that his biggest flaw was fixed by the park factors change alone. We've never seen, at least in the last five years, we haven't seen more than 167 and two-thirds like he had last year. So maybe you don't get 180, 190 up there. But if they're going to get him out of the game before he gets blown up the third time through the order, preserve those ratios, we expect him to be even a decent team again. I, I could see him at least splitting the difference between his 2021 results and even the more optimistic projections and ending up being a pretty good oatmeal value here yeah like three seven three seven five kind of guy and then i i think also uh the projections are like here's if you play him every game and i think when you take this Scafani, you can not play him against the dodgers right <laughs> he has some crazy ass splits against the dodgers where they've just taken him to town but uh if you play him all the time at home and then uh sometimes on the road you know, instead of getting 175 innings of a projected 4-2 ERA, you might get 130 innings of a 3-6-5, you know, and now you're happy. It's funny to me that the Giants actually have three starters that go in this range between Descafani, Alex Wood, and Alex Cobb. And there's something similar about all of these guys. Like there's the innings risk, there's a bumpy pass track record, but when they're good, they're very good, and a belief All sort of... that they can game plan and, and make them better than they typically were in the past on a somewhat regular basis. Like it, it's goofy to me. Like it's almost just like drafting any of those three out of Descafani, Wood, and Cobb is just trusting the Giants as an organization, trusting their process because this is what they're betting on to make them competitive again this year. Yeah, and they're you know they're pretty interchangeable in my ranks. I have uh, Discofani and Wood uh, in a virtual tie near the end of uh, you know this the high fifties, low sixties. I have Cobb a little bit lower at around seventy eight because he has a very large injury number in this, and also he has the worst stuff plus of the three. But all three are basically near average stuff, near average location, uh, decent decently wide arsenals right none of them are two pitch guys really um and uh some spotty health histories that's that's true that's that's if you wanted to do the top line on all three of them that is that's the thing that makes them all the same right right but i think like average guys with some spotty injury and then what you're hoping is they're a little bit like classed up um rich hills and these these sort of veteran signings that you make uh, with the team to uh, to to make sure you have enough innings, they're all like a, a sort of A plus versions of that. I think the separator in the group, the reason Desclafani goes the earliest is lower injury risk. It's not my perception of them. It is also supported by the calculations that Jeff Zimmerman made. I think Alex Wood's back injuries a few years ago. Mm-hmm. If you remember those? That that seemed that seemed very problematic at the time. But this is, to me, this is one of these spots where teams clearly see a market that is overcorrected. And that's why you you had people telling you they wanted to sign Carlos Rodon because that's a $30 million a year pitcher based on talent, but they're not going to pay him that much in AAV and they're not going to give him the massive deal. He's going to get less compared to, again, a Zach Wheeler type who got that, that nice deal with the Phillies a few seasons ago, which is working out great for Philly, by the way. To get to Jose Urquidy for a moment. We've talked about him a lot on this podcast. The concern, I think, above all, is really just health for Urquidy. If he's healthy, I think he's going to be good. And that's the whole story. <laughs> I don't have anything else. I don't have anything else I'm worried about with him. I, I yeah, you even see it in the it, it's not just the uh it's not just the the actual innings, it's that when he's healthy, he pitches better too. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. we, I think we saw times when he was pitching uh, at a reduced ability last year and you can see some fluctuation and stuff over the course of the season. There were times when he's coming back, there was the around Colorado. He just really had a hard time. And I think he ended up going on the IL after that. Um, so like to say that he has above average stuff and really good command. Um, I think that he has the potential of having better stuff. So, 
I have him uh, just a few ticks behind Clayton Kershaw because I see a similar sort of risk reward there. Uh, but obviously the projections see it very differently. <laughs> I mean, for his career now, we've seen 34 appearances, 32 starts, 177 and two-thirds innings, so basically a full season. And with that, we got a 355 ERA, a 102 whip, 147 Ks. The skills flaw would be the home runs allowed. He had 17 homers allowed in 107 innings last year. I think that kind of pushes back toward what you were saying. You know, When he's not completely healthy, he starts to run into some problems, and I think that's the problem he runs into when everything's not clicking. Yeah, yeah, because he keeps the bases clean and he has a wide arsenal and he is change up first, which uh, is a little bit disconcerting. Sometimes that leads to lower K rates, higher whips. We talked about this a few times on the show, but when he's healthy and going well, he has the breaking balls. Um, and that's why I like him so much, because it's, there's a potential there for a really wide arsenal that where all the pitches are good. John Means frequently discussed on this pod. I don't know if there's much yeah, more we need to virtual add. Virtual tie, virtual tie for Akiti. A lot of the yeah. same things, except that Means really dropped off after uh, sticky stuff enforcement, and it's just hard to tell exactly uh, where his true talent is, uh, stuff wise. But you know, Marco Estrada with workable curveballs, uh, workable breaking balls, uh, is something that's going to stymie projection systems because none of the projection systems ever got Marco Estrada right. And then you add in their description the of Marco Estrada. The park. Yeah. <laughs> I think the more fun names in this group are guys like Joe Ryan. And <laughs> I, I like the cry on. It, it, what are you, what are we doing with him? Like, is he even remotely close to real based on what we saw in a little bit of time in the big leagues last year? It, it, it's always been more of this, like hitters don't pick him up. Well, sort of profile. than the stuff is pure filthy. The minor league numbers were really good. Obviously, uh, Minnesota has a clear need for him to be in their rotation. From a workload perspective, if you add up all the innings he had in 2021, I think you're still under 100 innings. I think you're closer to like 92 and two-thirds if I'm able to do math quickly on the fly. So <laughs> there is a, a workload restriction likely in play here. If you go back to earlier seasons in the minors, he did go over 100 innings in 2019. So maybe they could push him to the 140, 150 range. But they're going to have to do something. All-star break, you know, work around that. Maybe skip a turn here and there. Skills-wise, though, does he have what it takes to replicate anything resembling his results coming up through the minors where he was really good at just about every stop? I have him higher than the model suggests I should, uh, but I'm going to be lower than the market probably. I have him right around 73, uh, where his uh, $9, the bat projection, looks out of place. Um, so I may not end up with many shares, but it's a complicated and interesting story because what's going on with him is that he does have good, uh, you know, kind of vertical approach angle is what I would call it, where... Uh, he's a short guy with a high over the top release where basically the ball comes on a string to, to home plate. Um, and that's that's good. Uh, it's hard for me to put in the model because it's a location based thing. So it's like both stuff and location. So I don't know exactly what bin to put it in. Um, so and I and I always thought that if we have release point and shape of pitch, we should we should be capturing that. But, um, you know, that's a discussion for another time he in that vertical approach angle and also the way he releases the ball, his elbow comes out first uh, and he hides the ball behind his elbow. Uh, and then the elbow pops out upon uh, at release in those two things. He has uh, two things that are not necessarily captured by my model. However, and they are good. However, he, the secondaries, we should be capturing the quality, their quality. Then they don't, none of them really uh, rate that well. So he might just be have this invisible and what else? And so therefore, my comps are Yuzmer Petit and uh, Ben Lively. These are the two guys that have uh, have released the ball this way and had the same problems with secondary stuff, had good command, but uh, uh, and and had good stints, but fall off terribly third time through the order just awfully because if you think about it 
Uh, both of those things are in a little bit of the deception thing. And I mentioned that Cameron Grove showed that third time through the order is mostly about uh, familiarity with stuff. So if he's deceiving you the first time through and the first time through the league, you know, wow, uh, you know, like this is the first time I'm seeing him. And, and if you imagine like in the minor leagues, like how many times do you see a guy? You're different, like, you know what I'm saying? Like batters versus pitchers. How many times do you see the same guy? Like you're you're kind of, you're going through levels as a hitter. He's going through levels as a pitcher. Like how many times do you, how many, what's the most anyone saw Joe Ryan in the minors? So, you know, every time someone's seeing him in the minors, like, what is the hell is this pitch? But, you know, uh, in the majors, you know, the how many times are the Royals going to see him, right? First time they're going to be like, what the hell is this pitch? Second time they'll be like, yo, you really just have to aim for the top of the ball or whatever it is, you know? Um, and, uh, and so I, I kind of think he may have some early success, but I don't see the, the, the real one for me is use Mara Petit. I think his long-term role is a multiple inning reliever that is super valuable to a team, but is not super valuable to a fantasy team. Yeah. And I, I kind of think the, the fact that the Rays produce so many guys like that, probably made them more willing to give up Joe Ryan in the Nelson Cruz trade. They probably saw uh, more of an up and down, like bulk guy for their purposes. Useful, but if they thought he was a real starter, they needed starters. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I think that's, that's important. They took to Shane Vaz and put him in the postseason. They took Joe Ryan and put him on another team. Right. Based on minor <laughs> league results, you, you just look at Ryan and be like, whoa, that guy's really good. So, you know, there's always a way to change, right? You add something to your arsenal. And, I wish and that... I had minor league stuff, dude. Yeah, yeah that would be, be really nice. I've got but a it... track man model. If someone can just feed me track man, minor league track man, this is a call. Anybody out there? Do you have any minor league track man? And you could do it, like, you know, discreetly, too. Just, just feed it to me. <laughs> I'll give you the stuff back. I should have been a computer programmer. <laughs> well, in this case, you have to be kind of like a pirate, too. I mean, it's, well, it's... <laughs> although uh, that'd be a hell of a business card, man. <laughs> be a great business card. <laughs> hey, I'm not, programmer not 40 slash yet. pirate. <laughs> I, could, I could probably consider a second career at some point. <laughs> First, you have to learn how to sail. Yeah. Yeah. I got to learn how to sail. I got to <laughs> develop more of a taste for rum. Yeah. <laughs> for bourbon to rum you know it looks the same in the bottle though really so it's it just just give me the bourbon in a rum bottle and we'll call it good uh, tristan mckenzie made some changes last year and I, I guess the question is can we buy the mid-season adjustments as uh more of a sticky step forward for him where he, he's going to deliver on his potential as a prospect obviously cleveland's got a good track record with pitching development i think the the takeaway for me going into last season was that Tristan McKenzie had probably more to work with than a lot of guys they were getting great mileage from in the past. So that's what made me excited about him last season. And as excited as I was, I did not keep him on my rosters after he was demoted in the places <laughs> where I had him. So when it turned around, I missed out. When it was bad at the beginning of the season, he was in my lineup. So what's next for Tristan McKenzie after those adjustments? Yeah, it is interesting because he had that great August where he comes back off the IL and he's throwing, you know, a couple ticks harder and he's a one nine three ERA and just, you know, looks like everything that we wanted him to be. However, if you, even if you take just his second half ERA, because it kind of fell back off again in September, October, and if you just take his second half ERA, it's a four five eight. And that's the word of caution I have is that Tristan McKenzie showed up on the biggest stuff risers list. Uh, I wrote a piece of on, on him. If you want to look at the, the four biggest stuff risers, uh, if you want to look at the 15, I I've got a, a leaderboard and then uh, I, I highlighted and McKenzie was one of the guys I highlighted. Uh, and one of the problems was uh, he took this huge leap forward and uh, had league average stuff. Hmm. So uh it is super important for him to throw hard. He needs to throw hard. He knows he needs to throw hard. He now knows that he needs to basically throw as hard as he can uh, every time he's out there. But uh, it doesn't mean that just if he throws hard, uh, that solves everything. That gets him to about league average stuff. Now, that you're right. The Indians have done great with guys that have don't have league average stuff. So, you know, the, the, the key is, can he do 
like what they want him to do. Can he show the good command? Can he command the secondaries? Can he mix his pitches up and throw uh, as hard as he can? Uh, and if he can, then, you know, then I think uh, he could be like a, at the end of the season, like a top 50 pitcher. Uh, I don't know that I see ace upside though. All right, so maybe maybe a good SP three if it all mm-hmm. sort of clicks in for a full season. I think when you said McKenzie has to throw as hard as he can, I wanted to hit the danger zone button, the first few chords from from danger zone because it would have been so appropriate. Because we we know when pitchers live like right around that max, it tends to be bad from a health perspective too. So I, I just feel like the thing that he needs to do to be optimally effective is also going to add injury risk to a guy that because of his very lean frame people already say he's got plenty of injury risk baked in had that lat mm-hmm. injury a couple of years ago and has been mostly pretty healthy otherwise so yeah i don't the, I, the I don't i don't know much about research about linking sort of frame and size to to that sort of thing i do you know it's definitely something that is um you know kind of lore uh, but I would say that there is definitely hard, fast research, really well sort of documented, and I think even peer-reviewed research from Glenn Fleisick at ASMI that uh, it's actually, you know, stress on the elbow is almost relative. It's not necessarily that, uh, you know, a role as Chapman throwing 100 has more stress point. Yes, he does have put more stress on his elbow than perhaps... Um, you know, someone throwing 91, but it's not uh, rock solid. What is rock solid is if the Rodas Chapman throws his maximum, he's putting the most stress on his elbow. So the closer you throw to your personal maximum, the more stress you're putting on your elbow. I think that actually, uh, when I saw that, it's a kind of a light bulb for modern pitching, right? Um, we're asking these pitchers to go out there and get the most out of them every single inning. We're, we've now taken starters and relievers and said, how can we get the most out of each? Oh, it turns out we only get the starters go four and a half and the relievers do the other four and a half. You know what I mean? And everybody go out there and throw as hard as you can for, you know, for two, three innings or one inning or whatever it is. And uh, that's the best way to maximize you. Well, that also means you're going to get hurt. And we're, we're asking basically for peak human performance at all times. And, you know, the, I don't th- like, in other words, I don't think you can science the injuries away. No, you can't sprint a marathon. Yeah. Just, you know, but, oh, well, you'd be faster if you did it that way. Yeah. And you'd die. So, <laughs> you know, you wouldn't actually finish because you'd be dead. But the way the game is played, like you're kind of you're kind of asking people to kind of, you know, sprint, 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 sprint. So unless there's a change in the rules, I think, or in the incentives somehow, uh, this is this is baseball and this is it's going to come with injuries. So we're pretty clearly adding extra episodes just based on the amount of time we're spending on players in this range. But it's important. Well, because this I think, is... yeah, I think the last, I think the last episode, maybe we could have a week on this. Maybe we could have a week of sleepers, right? Or just a week of like late guys, right? Where we just go to kind of go through different positions and, and go for late. Because right now, I think the, the, what we're going through is kind of the last, some of the last pitchers for, for most uh, shallower 12 and 15 team leagues. We're, we're talking about the kind of the last pitchers you'll get. So then there's, you know, has to be another episode for like the deep sleepers. Right. So if we hustle through the next range of 50, it's probably because we're going to come back to them or some of those guys on a future episode. Uh, Waskari Noah, pretty interesting what he was doing last year. Just a guy that wasn't really on my radar. And uh, not surprisingly, he was on Jeff Zimmerman's radar because why wouldn't he be? But mm-hmm. punched a bench, missed some time during the season. So we had the regular season innings end up a lot lighter than they should have been had he not done that. Plus, he was removed from Atlanta's roster in the NLCS uh, with shoulder inflammation. So there's the possibility that there's a little something going on there. Results, though, were good. Over a strikeout per inning. Walk rate wasn't bad. ERA was solid, 405. Whip was good at 111 last year. Uh, It was really kind of a two-pitch approach for Enoa. So... I'm curious to know if if you're interested in him in this range because I, I think Enoa versus McKenzie versus Ryan it, it, that's a reasonable sort of decision that people are going to be making in just about every draft. I, I'm about to kind of out on all three. There's other guys I like in their range better. The one thing there, there's so many things. You know, has um, one of the highest injury projections. He's a top five injury projection guy. 
I wonder if, too- if punching things in the dugout actually adds 10 days of, of IL risk in the model. I, yeah. I, it's tempting to be like, well, you know, maybe the model didn't know that he, you know, hurt himself punching versus we're throwing. But I, I think Jeff Zimmerman did these by hand and, and looked at, at, looked at comps. So I, I bet you it's a little bit more about the shoulder bit mm-hmm. than it is about the broken hand. Either way, he's a two pitch guy and that's going to limit, I think his uh, potential for innings within a game, uh, it's going to limit his potential for wins. Uh, then there's the limiting uh, on the innings in terms of injury. Um, I, I guess I like him better than the other two that you mentioned just now. All right. Let's see. Because it's a legit good two pitch mix. I actually think the more interesting guy that goes in this range is John Gray. I think John Gray leaving Colorado, it's just a complete opportunity to press reset for him Mm -hmm. and we've seen the rangers take kind of mid-career pitchers and have a lot of success with them in recent years going back to mike minor a few years ago lance lynn kyle gibson this is the the place where they as an organization seem to have a legitimate uh, scouting eye or ability to just take someone and, and make it work and obviously leaving colorado is good for any pitcher He's not the same guy that he was when he entered the league in terms of stuff, but he's still pretty good. So is John Gray, especially because of of what I think is a pretty reasonable volume expectation, maybe one of the more undervalued pitchers in this range because he's kind of fallen into the oatmeal group despite having a really nice prospect pedigree years ago. Yeah, uh, it's difficult for me to see exactly what, he could do outside of court. Like it's, you know, you look at his stuff and I'm mean, like, Oh, well, it's not, that's not super exciting, but uh, the curveball is much more average away from home because, you know, because of physics, um, you know, the curveball just didn't get, doesn't get the same bite in, in cores. So if you take him out of cores and now you give him an average curveball or a really good slider and an average fastball, maybe he has, he has average stuff. I, you know, and it has a nice home park. I think it adds up to being kind of an average pitcher, which is not uh, super exciting for fantasy, but um, I, I, the fastball shape is not, it was ideal for Coors. In fact, I wrote a piece with Nick Groke about this, that he had this kind of this weird fastball that, um, was ideal for Coors, but is not ideal for other places. <laughs> mm. um, it's the type of shape that lo- that retains more of its shape in Coors, and so therefore allows him to to have more fastball command of home and, and away from home because it doesn't change that much. Uh, it's one of those weird pitches that doesn't change that much based on what's happening in Coors, but it also doesn't have a lot of ride. Um, so he's uh, it's all all based on the slider. I, I think that a new team might uh, push that slider usage even further to 40, 45 percent. Um, and uh, and maybe the curveball usage uh, push that up to 10, 15 percent, um, which could push his strikeouts per nine into, you know, sort of 10 per nine. Um, but I don't know that his uh, home runs allowed will change as dramatically as people might think. And his batting average on balls in play has been about the same. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of peripherals where, you know, that that little bit of extra strikeout might be enough to get him to like a 3-9 ERA. That's sort of where I see his upside. Yeah, I just think it's 3-9 and like a 125 whip with close to a strikeout per inning and, and maybe bulk. So it's it's oatmeal-y for me. Mm-hmm. And, and the park is a good place to pitch too. So I, I think that's the other... It's not even just that he's going to uh, a better place, that he's going to what seems like a very good place to pitch for half of the starts. AL West has a few soft opponents that he can uh, match up really well against, too. Steven Matz goes in this range. I, I I just don't see it with Matz. I never, I never have at any point. I've never been someone who is excited about Steven Matz. Out to the, the, the park, the defense, and streaming matchups. That's about it. I like him a lot better in the NL Central than I did in the AL East by comparison, but he it's falls into the classic. Part. I just like other pitchers better that go all, all around him. Yeah. 
Yeah, I've got him uh, in the low 90s and uh, next to uh, Casey Mize and Albert Alzale because uh, that's where his stuff numbers line up. Um, and Matt's has the best park situation, but I don't know. I'd rather have maybe Mize or Alzale because uh, I feel like they're a tweak away. Alzale was throwing a cutter late in the season. I think that could change things for him. Uh, Mize has changed his pitch mix pretty dramatically uh, since he came in the league as a rookie. So um, I think there's still a little bit of, uh, of pitch mix upside there. Um, and uh, with Matt's, I think we saw the, I just think we saw the peak. You know, it's not a good shape on the sinker and it can easily be battered. So I, I, uh, I, I don't know. And when I say that it's not a good shape on the, let's see what we're talking about here on the, on the sinker. Something I, I know for Canon, but I haven't looked, <laughs> haven't looked recently. Okay. Even la we'll use last year where he had a, a good season. Uh, the, oh man, the sinker has basically exactly average movement, which is exactly what you don't want <laughs> because what other thing do our hitters more prepared for than exactly average i think for me the the problem with mats has always just been the depth of his arsenal like I, I just feel like he leans so heavily on two pitches that he becomes predictable too like that's the other that's the problem i've had with him over the years that the results in toronto like, exceeded my expectations for sure like i i was clearly not in on him last year and, and missed out, but this isn't just uh, FOMO. And it, it is more of a three pitch mix now, throws the occasional slider to give him a fourth. But slider gave up a 558 slugging last year. And yeah. I think the slider was problematic in New York. He was throwing the Wartham slider, which, uh, you know, some people associate with injury. There, there is a possibility that it could be associated with injury because uh, breaking balls have less produce less stress on the elbow than fastballs. However, if you adjust for, uh, if you adjust for velocity, uh, per mile per hour, breaking balls have more, right? So if you actually throw a really hard slider, like the Dan Worthen slider, it, it could be pretty stressful on the elbow. And so what we saw in New York was he would be trying to throw this Worthen slider. And when he threw it, he was injured a lot, right? Uh, I don't think he was throwing the Worth Insider in, in Toronto, but it also wasn't a good one. <laughs> so, uh, you know, sinker change curve. Sinker's not good. Change is pretty good. Curve is about average. Uh, ends up being a kind of an average, average-ish pitcher who has been worse in the past. So we got a decision to make, you know, do we roll out another tier here or do we save these pitchers for a future episode? Let me look at the names. It's a good group. The next group, whenever we talk about them, Herman Marquez, Bailey Ober, Aaron Savali, Cal Quantrill, Kyle Hendricks, Casey Mize, Aaron Ashby, Josiah Gray, Steven Strasburg, Drew Rasmussen, Carlos Carrasco, Jesus Lazardo, Andrew Heaney. A lot of good names. How about we each there. pick our two favorite out of this tier right here? All right. And then we'll Sausage do... Sausage is being made. Pick yeah, our we'll, two favorite. We'll do more in the future on the names we don't get to the two that i like the most in this group believe it or not are kyle Hendricks and aaron ashby mm. Hendricks, i know it's it's just a it's risky because he just doesn't throw hard and once it's gone it's gone but i think when i look at what he's been able to do over the course of his career with the arsenal that he has i'm not i'm not punting on him after one one down year like that i just I, I think health might have been a factor they didn't pitching through some things i'm not drafting him for strikeouts necessarily like i'll get some because of the volume he usually brings i'm drafting him for ratios and you're getting him at a point where most pitchers are going to have an era in the fours a whip in the 120s and hendrix might be a mid threes era guy with like a 115 whip again like that's a possibility projections aren't on it they're saying it's over I understand the that. bulk is there and you know, there, there are things he can do that stymie the systems. Like for example, he has two, two change-ups. And if you average out the two change-ups, they average out to a kind of an, an okay change-up where maybe he actually has two plus change-ups that go in different directions. So yeah, we didn't get a velo dip last year. So I, I don't think that's necessarily the problem for him. So it's just a, it's a pure bounce back play. I just think and, he's, and he's being overcorrected on right now. 
he's a one man example of why you you know you bet on stuff because stuff is more similar year to year the bet on kyle hendrix is location and last year the location was gone but that doesn't mean he couldn't get it back he's had elite location for a long time so i think if he got the elite location back he would be usable and also super super cheap and probably innings and i think you know worst case scenario he's a guy where you know, maybe he doesn't start out good, but you, especially in a draft and hold, you keep him, you have him on your roster. And at some point in the season, you're happy you have him there. So uh, it's a little bit different maybe, but I think actually it works okay even in a non-draft and hold situation, right? Because what you do is you're picking him for one of your last pitchers. You put him on your roster. If it doesn't start out great, fine, drop him, move on. You know? He's probably at least a home streamer, and there's certainly still some some room for more in there. And maybe it fits into some of the risks I'm taking earlier. He kind of helps offset mm-hmm. some of the the health risks and 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 that because I think he's going to give us more innings than a lot of other guys within this range, especially someone like Ashby. I mean, Ashby doesn't have a rotation spot to call his own as it stands right now. They could make a change. They could make a trade. Whatever it might be, an injury could open up a spot. There's only well, Lauer has one of those spots, right? Lauer and, and Hauser, right? So you got both of those it's guys kind of hanging around. <laughs> those are those are achievable spots. Yeah. So they're, you know, they might be ahead of him in the pecking order technically right now, but Ashby's the better option. So one of those guys, beating one of those guys out and having one of those guys take the the swing role. Is that really that much of a stretch? I don't think it is. It was only 31 and two thirds innings from him last year, but we saw it. The, the called strikes and whiffs were there. How about a 33.5% CSW? We love to see that. There's a little bit of a control issue, but hit, hitters just don't see him well. You can you can see it in the reactions. Like there's there's just like this look of confusion on guys' faces as they mm. they walk out of the box after facing him. So I hadn't considered him for a uh, deception guy, but I the, he, you know he's interesting by uh, the pitching plus model because. Uh, he has below average stuff and bro- below average location plus, but above average pitching plus. And the reason that is, is that um, the stuff plus only likes his changeup as above average. So that's his action pitch. Uh, location plus only likes really his slider as above average. So that's his his command pitch. But pitching plus says, hey, dude, he has an action pitch. He has a secondary action pitch. He has a secondary location pitch, and he has a, a fastball that has basically average stuff and average location. So pitching plus re spiders basically is a, it starts from scratch. It's not just you know stuff plus plus location plus. It's it's more like how does this whole thing fit together as an arsenal? And uh, and so I think it's he's a fascinating case for one of the ideas is that uh, command is more important than stuff on the on the slider. Well, there you go. He doesn't have great stuff on the slider, but he has great command on the slider. Uh, maybe change up action pitch slider for for you know if you put the slider in the right place, really low and away, it matters more than uh, exactly the 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 shape of that pitch. So um, I I think this the the model might be under underrating or the stuff might be underrating him. Uh, and I hadn't thought that maybe deception is a part of it. I I do I do like him. Um, I. Maybe don't like him as much as there. He's he's a favorite sort of hype guy. Yeah, and, could creep you up. May, yeah, you could see some 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 crazy uh, some crazy helium on him. Uh, I like Hal Hendricks because there's no helium, uh, and he's super achievable in every draft. <laughs> you know, like he's very very gettable. Uh, who are the guys I like? I wanted to mention Drew Rasmussen. Um, you know. I know that the strikeout rate was surprising and the whiff rate on the slider was surprising. But if you watch the slider, you're like, that is a nasty friggin' slider. And I've talked to people in the Rays organization. I've been like, y'all have a, as good stuff numbers as I do on, on Drew Rasmussen, right? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, and on the slider, right? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, why is you have a great whiff rate on the slider? And they're like, we don't know. Uh, but I... I think it's just an anomaly because it the, the eye test, it fits the eye test. He has a great breaking ball and he has a great fastball and the changeup isn't great, but, and, and the stuff came down off of where it was as a reliever, but I saw enough out of him as a starter and I see enough need in Tampa for him as a starter that I think he will at least start the season uh, in the rotation and uh, give you a bunch of innings uh, that will be good. 
uh, who's my other name on this one that I like the best? Mm, um, it's not Bailey Ober, is it? Uh, no, I and think it's it would be definitively not Josiah Gray. <laughs> um, and uh, you, you know, buying Haney, Lizardo with the with the velo up at Cressy Camp. Uh, velo could be huge for him, but the shape on his fastballs is not good. Uh, how about this? If Drew Rasmussen is my Aaron Ashby. Um, then my Kyle uh, Hendricks is Carlos Carrasco. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, I know from Jeff that he was very hard to model in terms of injury. Um, I mean, just think about the things that Carlos Carrasco has dealt with. <laughs> like, I mean, like how many other people uh, have Hodge? Is it Hodgkin's Lavona? Like, you know, how many people have leukemia? Short. Short list of, of big leaders. Yeah, like what what do the cops say on leukemia? Um, yeah, but, double contusion, uh, leukemia in 19, and then a strained hamstring last year. 121 days lost that hamstring. Wow. Yeah, and, you know, the Stuff Plus model didn't really like him. Uh, you know, had like 94 Stuff Plus, but he had good location. The arsenal is still wide, and uh, the park is really nice. And I could see... Uh, really, I would love to put him on some benches where worst case scenario, you, you pitch him again, you know, in Florida, you know, in Miami, you pitch him at home, uh, against Miami, you pitch him at home against probably even the Phillies. It's a city field is a sneaky, good home park. And so it's not necessarily a stuff play. It's not necessarily a sexy play. I don't think you'll see Carlos Carrasco on a lot of lists of, you know, this is a guy you got to get in your draft. And I'm not necessarily saying you have to get him. There's, there is injury risk and maybe the, the injury model is not even capturing all of it, but uh, a nice, healthy off season, uh, you know, going into a park that he knows now that is a good home park. Uh, I, I could see him being really useful, not necessarily being someone that, you know, you want to start every week, but somebody that you want to start a lot of weeks. Probably some good news. If you like Carrasco, the, from a like a draft day cost perspective, the projections are brutal. So he's there's just no way to catch helium until you get yeah, to <laughs> spring sorry. training. Like if he goes out in spring, looks like his old self, you know, strikes out 15 guys in 15 innings, has that kind of result in, in some grapefruit league games, then there might be some some interest. Hey, Carlos Carrasco's back. Look at his track record. That that could become the narrative. But if the projections are as For bad now. as they look right now, like no one's moving him up. He's free. Yeah. Kyle Hendricks and Carlos Carrasco are free. Well, and I think at least in the case of Hendricks, I'm fairly confident that we're going to get a, a decent volume of, of innings, especially for uh, for the pitchers in that tier, but just even in the overall pool of pitchers. That's going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. Before we go, a reminder, you can sign up for The Athletic. It's $1 a month for the first six months at theathletic.com slash rates and barrels. We don't really do a better deal than that so if you were holding out on subscribing this would be a very good time to get in the door if you got questions for a future episode you can drop us an email rates and barrels at theathletic.com or ask in the comment section under this video on youtube if you're watching us on youtube be sure to smash the like button because clicking the like button is not enough you actually have to smash it and as always you can find us on twitter he's at you know saris i am at Derek Van Riper. That's going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. We are back with you on Monday. Thanks for listening.